We've previously considered the journey of Christmas as we've thought of the journey from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And today we're thinking of another journey, a journey we've been singing about, a journey from the east to the west, a very long journey and one that is recorded to us in Holy Scripture. And we're going to read about that if, I, if you stand with me and as we read the ancient words of Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And even if this mic goes off, you can still keep reading, all right? So let's read the text of Scripture. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen, when it rose, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Amen. Please be seated. That's Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And if you've got your Bible, uh, you may care to turn there, Matthew chapter 2. On this journey of Christmas, we're going to learn, first of all, the journey of Christmas requires a personal decision. Here are wise men who decide to go on a journey, think of this, to worship someone they have never yet met. These wise men were told they come from the east, that is, east of Israel. They may have come uh, from Persia, uh, from Babylon. They may have come from present-day Iraq or Iran, or even possibly Saudi Arabia, as we call it today. Uh, these wise men are Gentiles, and they're going to travel a long, long distance to come and worship this one they describe as the king of the Jews. They are wise men. That is, they're educated, they're trained in different disciplines like astrology, mathematics, and science, and ancient scripture and religions. And we don't know what motivated and prompted these men in their studies and their discussions, but several of them then make a decision, a very, very important decision, based on the information they have, as we read in verses 1 and 2, that wise men from the east came, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose. That is, when it rose in the east. Perhaps they read the ancient Hebrew Scriptures about a coming Messiah, about a king. Uh, they refer uh, to it as his star, the star of the king of the Jews. And so they begin this long journey, journeying from the east to the west. Not by plane, not by car, not by bicycle, on their horses, on their camels, perhaps sometimes on food, over a different terrain, and they're following the star. Uh, they leave their comfort, they leave what they know, and in a sense, go into the unknown, seeking this person who is born king of the Jews. Isn't that remarkable that men 2,000 years ago made such a journey of Christmas? 
That was a very, very, very long journey. We don't know how long it was. Uh, we thought of the journey of, from Nazareth to Bethlehem made by Mary and Joseph. That was a long journey as well, particularly for a young woman who was carrying a child. But this is a much, much longer journey. And they're traveling into unknown territories, into different cultures, into speaking, into conversing with people who are speaking different languages. Probably a very dangerous journey to take. But can I say, such a journey is one which wise men and women make. They are searching, searching for truth. God had graciously revealed some truth uh, to them, in a sense, not much truth, but what they see, they respond to. That's very, very important, isn't it, in life? In a sense, we're on a spiritual journey, all of us, deep within the human heart, deep within our heart. There's often a sense of emptiness, a sense of restlessness, which cries out for fulfillment and meaning, and which propels us on the journey of life. Unless we're very, very superficial people, all of us have wondered if there's more to life than what we see, what we experience, what we understand. Is there anything else out there? What is our ultimate destiny? If there is a God, how can we know this God? How can we be acceptable to this God? How can we worship this God? How can we please this God? How can we find this God? How do I know what is true? in this journey of life. On that long and winding journey of life, the wise men encountered many different things and experiences. And many of you have found, haven't you, that things in life which seem to promise so much, yet have delivered so little. As we journey in our life, there are various possibilities attract us and beckon us. And sometimes on the journey of life, we're tempted to go down certain roads to try certain things, certain experiences that beckon to us, that others encourage us to go. And sometimes, even although uh, these perhaps, this perhaps might be a journey into darkness, we sometimes go down that road and we experience an emptiness and a disillusionment. Moths are instinctively drawn to the light Here's a moth, here's a candle, and the moth is in its instinct drawn to the light, but the very light which draws the candle, draws the moth, destroys the moth as it hits the fire of the candle. And sometimes the choices that you have made have led to disastrous consequences for yourself, for others decisions which you've made in life, which in the short term you thought were for your pleasure, for your enjoyment, uh, for your advancement in life, to make more money or whatever it was. In the short term, it seemed a good decision, but you realize it was now it was a very, very bad decision, and it has hurt not only yourself, but others that love and care for you. And so we continue our journey of life Yes, some choices we make are disastrous. Other choices give us hope. But each one on this journey have to make very important decisions. We see this as our students go off to college. We say you're going to be faced with decisions, and it's very, very important that at the beginning you make the right decisions. Uh, that's true for 18-year-olds, but it's also true for 8-year-olds. And it's true for 28 year olds and 38 years old and 68 years old and 88 years old. All of us face decisions in life. Some of them seem inconsequential. Some of them seem very, very routine. Others, of course, set the whole journey of life. These wise men, as they begin this journey of Christmas, remind us that personal decisions have to be made. These were wise men, and they certainly made a wise decision to follow the star. And so they leave their home, their comfort, their family, everything that they know, and set out on this journey following a star which rose 
in the East. This journey of Christmas also requires a personal response to divine revelation. I think it's, this is wonderful that the Holy Scriptures tell us something very, very important and shows us the character and the nature of God, that those who seek God, God will reveal Himself. And here are these men. We can picture them reading their ancient literature. Uh, we can picture them looking at the stars and trying to figure out life and having many discussions and seminars and lectures, as it were, and doing mathematical equations because these are very highly educated men. And to their amazement, one day there's this star that rises, and together they make a decision, and they make a personal response to divine revelation. They saw the star, and they humbly followed it. To some, that would have thought utter foolishness. Where was it going to lead them? They didn't know. How long was the journey? We don't know. What will be the result? We don't know. But we understand this. This is going to lead us to the King of the Jews, and we're going to worship Him. That we do know. And God graciously revealed Himself to them as they followed the star. You ever been enthralled by the, the night sky? I think most of us have. You ever seen the aurora borealis? We call them the northern lights. Some of you go to Iceland. Last time I, I saw the aurora, the aurora borealis, or the northern lights, was in the most northerly islands of Scotland, the Shetland Islands. I was there a few years ago visiting a friend of mine, and we had been out for a meal, and as we were coming home, and he was parking his car in the driveway. He says to me, John, stop, look. And I looked. And there, yes, as spectacular as that slide, were the aurora borealis, the beauty of the stars. In that cold climate, the greens and the flashing lights, amazing, breathtaking in its beauty. Few people are unmoved by the awesome stillness of a star-studded universe. We're told that at night, to the human eye, there are about 6,000 stars visible. I never counted them. 6,000, that's a lot of stars. Listen, that's only a speck. There are many, many more. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, has over 100 billion stars. That's a conservative estimate. How many stars are there? Scientists, again, giving a conservative estimate, says there are 200 sex stillion stars. That's 200 billion trillion. How many zeros is that? Yeah, that looks like our national debt, doesn't it? But uh, <laughs> we keep adding zeros and zero, zeros, don't we? Um, but the, the estimated stars in the universe, don't you find that absolutely mind-blowing? The power of God. Listen to what the psalmist says. Psalm 147, verse 4. He, the Lord, determines the numbers of the stars. Remember in the creation account in Genesis 1, uh, when the writer says he made the, 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 the moon and the sun, and then he says, it's almost like a throwaway line, and he made the stars also. Billions and billions of them. God determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Some people struggle and take weeks of argument to decide the name of their child. God gives names to all of their stars. Psalmist says, great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. You cannot measure the wisdom and the understanding of God. It's impossible to understand the power of God that He made all of the stars. He gives names to them all. He holds them in their course. Verse 6, the Lord lifts up the 
humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. As you look at the stars, as you look at the Milky Way, when you think of the power of God, a trust that promotes humility in you. See, as we look at the stars, as we look up away from our own petty little existence, as we look up at the sky at night particularly, we're reminded of our own puniness, aren't we? We're reminded how small we are in this vast universe that our scientists can't calculate how big it is, and God is bigger than that. The very heavens can't contain God. He's so huge. He's so big. And life then, as we think of the, of the sky, it often seems so pointless, and we sometimes think of the melancholy of human existence, because these stars in our universe have witnessed generation after generation come and go on this earth, but the stars remain. But are these stars pointing to a greater reality? Certainly that star was to the wise men. And indeed, I believe that the stars are pointing to something greater than themselves. Of course they are. These stars are the divine creation of God. They remind us of the glory and the majesty and the beauty and the creativity of this God who always existed. The stars are the handiwork of God, and they remind us that the answer to our own searching and restlessness and the answer to our desire for significance and meaning in the journey of life is not found by looking into ourselves. That's the mistake of our therapeutic world, isn't it? You go to the average therapist, tell them the prob your problems, and they will really say the problem is within yourself, something that happened to you in the past, and we're going to look within because you really have the answer within. The stars say, no, absolutely not. That's, that's the wrong way to look at it. The answer to life is not found by looking within ourselves. It's not found by me going to you and you giving me the answer. It is rather by humbly looking up, looking away from ourselves. We don't have the answer. Humanity doesn't have the answer. Human civilization doesn't have the answer. We have the best minds trying to figure out what we can do in the Middle East. We have the best minds trying to figure out how we can conduct ourselves as human beings on this planet. Brilliant minds educated minds, based on the generation after generation of wisdom and knowledge which has accumulated over the years, and we still can't get it right, because the answer is not found within, it's found without. And the wise men, for all of their wisdom, for all of their education, for all of their understanding and education, looked up. Because God, the great, eternal God, was giving them a revelation, was giving them a star, follow the star. That takes humility. Didn't you see that in the psalm I read? Who does God look to? The proud? No, to the humble, to those who realize by themselves we're making a mess of our life, and I need your help. When one of the first Soviet cosmonauts was in space, it was recorded, he, when he came back, he said, well, I was in space, and I didn't see God. He was an atheist. Someone had said, yeah, but if he'd stepped out of the spaceship, he certainly would have seen God. <laughs> Here's one of the great truths of Scripture that God gives divine revelation to those who in humility look up in the journey of Christmas. Are you doing that? You, you think you're pretty educated? You think you got your life figured out? You think you got life by the tail? Think you're in charge? Stop. Stop. Get out at night. Look up. 
see the stars and think how small you are. And these stars, right from the beginning of creation, have been shining, and here you are. And as you journey in life <clears throat> like these wise men, be steadfast in your journey. In search for the king of the Jews, the wise men experienced quite a number of difficulties. First of all, they had to make a very, very long journey. A long journey into unknown territory. Secondly, King Herod, as they went to the king, as we read, when they went to King Herod, he tried to deceive them. He tried to manipulate them. He was right there. He was in Israel. Instead of helping him, no, he deceived them. Then there was the religious establishment, the chief priests and the scribes. They knew the Scriptures. They got the answer right, but they showed no real interest in the truth. What was their problem? Lack of humility. They knew the answer, so we can, we can tell you the, the Bible verse. We've got that. We've got that memorized. We've exegeted the text. We can tell you the right answer. But there was no humility. And their traditions, the religious traditions, as so often is the case, blinded the minds of the chief priests and the scribes to the truth. Bible knowledge by itself doesn't always lead to personal faith. Their hearts, their minds, their wills were not open to divine revelation. They were not looking up. The revelation was being given, but they missed it. These wise men had journeyed arguably hundreds of miles. The chief priests, the scribes, and the people, they were only about five miles away from the manger, but they didn't go. They missed it. Haven't you found on your journey, do you seek God? Haven't you found that there are often difficulties, obstacles, sometimes your own family, sometimes what you've taught, your religious past, your, your heritage, and all of these things, some of which you respect and value, and yet sometimes they can blind us to the truth. And we have to understand the importance of humility, the importance of looking up, of looking away from ourselves, of responding to God's revelation, rather than thinking that life is all about the here and now, our pleasures, our material things, what is going to make life comfortable to us. These wise men know in spite of the difficulties, in spite of the deception, in spite of the arrogance, they continued to follow the star. And I assure you that you may be experiencing some opposition as you search for Jesus Christ and as you search for the truth. And people may be making life very difficult for you. I want to say to you, be steadfast in your journey. Be a wise person. Humbly seek the truth. Here is the promise of Scripture. If you have a sincere and humble heart, God will continue to reveal His truth to you. Who does God reveal His truth to? The proud? The self-righteous, the powerful, no. The broken, the humble, the lowly, the poor. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Will you do that? Will you seek the Lord? Will you call upon him while he is near? 
Jeremiah 29, 13, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Don't be a dabbler in the Christian faith. Don't just follow Jesus when it's convenient. This is radical. This is the most important journey of your life, to know Christ and to follow Christ. And here is the promise. If I seek God with all of my heart, he will be found by me. What's your personal response to God's revelation? The journey of Christmas for the wise man leads to the Savior. Verse 9, Behold the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Do you see it? These mighty wise men now, they're falling down and they're worshiping a little boy. Worshiped him, then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. Oh, their search led them to Jesus, the King, not just the King of the Jews, but the King of kings and Lord of lords. And Matthew says, when that happened, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They knew that God in His grace had led them to this one, and they bow, and they worship Him, and they open their treasures and present their very best to Him, their gold and frankincense and myrrh. This was a life-transforming experience for them. Wise men worshiping Jesus, giving their very best to the Lord. Incidentally, our generosity is a good test of the reality of our faith. Would you agree? Nice to sing, oh, come let us adore him. That doesn't take any effort from us. Come to service, talk about Jesus. Ah, but these wise men, you see, this was radical. The bowing down and worshiping was central to their understanding of who Jesus was. And so they opened their treasures and gave to him, symbolizing that this one, this little baby, was worthy of the very best and that everything they had, the very best that they had, were given to the Savior. You ever surrendered all to Christ? Oh, I know you've sung about it. I surrender all. But of you. It's amazing how generous we are with ourselves. But when it comes to giving on the Lord's Day, when it comes to giving to reach, welcome, grow, to reach other people for Christ, how hesitant we are. How, how, how is your giving, giving been over, over 2023 in your journey of life? If it was known, would, would you be embarrassed? Perhaps you're even a leader here, and you can open the Scriptures and tell us the meaning of the text, and that's wonderful, but uh, you're, you're holding back. Your life is not really characterized by faith. You see, when we understand who the Lord Jesus is, it means that everything we are and we have belongs to Him. That's the point, isn't it? He made us. Listen, He made the stars. It's not that God needs anything that I can give Him. He owns the universe. He owns all, he owns all the stars. That's not the point. The gold, the frankincense, and myrrh were God's… I mean, He made the gold. He made the, the frankincense and the mirror. It all belongs to him. Ah, but in his grace, he'd allowed these wise men to accumulate some of this. And here is an indication of their love for this young child, their understanding of who he was, and so they give with generosity of heart. It's a great pattern for us, isn't it? And not only did God lead the wise men to the child, 
verse 12, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. God continued to lead them. And here's the wonderful thing. When we have a saving encounter with the Lord Jesus, He will lead us for the rest of our lives. That's what it means. This is central to who we are at Calvary Church, being and making authentic followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, what's a disciple, one who follows Jesus Christ? I begin when I come and open my heart and receive Christ as my Savior and Lord, but that is just the beginning. I wish we understood that. that that's just the beginning of the Christian life, not the end. Wonderful thing to say that you're saved and forgiven, but has there been progress? During 2023, have you been following the Savior? Think of the wonder of handing all of my life over to Christ and following Him. And in a few days when we come into 2024, how wonderful to know that the Savior who led me thus far is going to continue to lead me. He will never, ever leave me. He'll provide for me. And the journey of the wise men remind us that left to ourselves, we can never know God. We're locked into our own little world. It's impossible for us by ourselves to reach the great, transcendent, all-majestic God. But God in His grace in the journey of Christmas has come to us. And that when our Lord Jesus comes into the world, one of the amazing things He says, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. See, because as we journey, we get lost in our life, don't we? We turn into cul-de-sacs, and we get off track, and we're lost, and we end up in the ditch, and here our Savior comes, the wonder of it all, into our world, and He comes to rescue us. He comes to save me, and He does this through His death as He is the Savior. He is God with us. He's the Savior who comes and dies in our place, rises from the dead, and is alive, and says, now, if you trust me with all of your heart, if you receive me, not only will I save your, save your sins, I'll wash your sins, I'll give you eternal life. The promise of the gospel is that everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die, that the eternal life that we receive here and now is a life which continues for all of eternity as I will never, ever be separated from my Savior. That's the promise of the gospel. Do you believe it? Why are you worried about tomorrow? Why are you worried about next week? Follow the Savior. Be a wise man. Be a wise woman, a wise boy, a wise girl. On our journey, God confronts us with His divine revelation. Astonishingly, the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who created the billions of stars, wishes to have a personal relationship with us because this God, although majestic in His power, is a God of love, is a God of grace, a God who made you and me and knows us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, and if God gave all of the stars' names, He certainly knows you and me. We're far, far of more value than a star. And our Savior comes and dies on the cross so that we can be saved and that we can know this Christ. And I ask you to do what millions of people have done down through the ages. The shepherds did it. The wise men did it. It's to bow at the feet of the Savior and say, come and save me and cleanse me. And I worship you. And with the power of your Spirit, I will love you with all of my heart. Come to the Savior. Open your heart. Open your treasure, as it were, abandoning all to Christ, and say, here I am. Use me and serve me. I know many of you have prayed to receive Christ, but perhaps in your journey over 2023, you've strayed. 
as we come to the Lord's table, you need to ask for forgiveness. Because those who partake at the Lord's table have to have clean hands and a pure heart. And that cleanse and, and forgiveness comes not by ourselves, not through the church, but comes alone through Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Our Father and our God, as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the wise men. One example they, they are to us of steadfastness. And many of us are much more privileged than wise men because for all of our life we've known about the Savior. But afresh we bow at his feet. And as we come to the Lord's table, we're reminded of the, of the cost of our salvation. Move in our hearts through your spirit, Father. Shake us from our spiritual lethargy. Humble us under the mighty hand of God that we'll understand not only something of the majesty of the creation, but the majesty of you, the creator. As we have already sung, O come, let us adore him. Forgive us, Father. Help us, to looking, help us to keep looking to Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.